Lord, thank you for calling me and equipping me. And Lord, thank you for giving me your grace for this journey. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. I want to read over you, just, just receive this. This is the, some of the very last words in the book of Hebrews. It says, Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good, with everything good, that you may do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Those are the same words we heard there in the video. And, and I think that any time there's an opportunity for somebody to kind of have a, a, a final conversation, these are the things that I want you to get. It's, it's important for us to pay attention to them because I think those words reflect so much of the heart that has pervaded this entire letter that we've been studying together for the last 13 weeks. In fact, Hebrews chapter 13, as we'll see here in just a little bit, diff is, is in a little bit, is just a little bit different. Um, because the author kind of has this way of saying, here's the things that I want you to get. I don't know if you've ever had a situation or an opportunity, maybe when you were a kid and you're like leaving for camp or something like that, and your mom's like saying, don't forget this, don't forget this, don't forget this, right? We know that. Or in my case, like when my wife goes out of town for like a girl's weekend, right? She does this every couple of years and I'm driving her to the airport. She'll say like, okay, don't forget to feed the dog. Like, got it. Like, don't forget to take out the trash. The, the, it gets picked up. Okay, I got that. Like, don't forget to feed the kids. Okay, I got, <laughs> like, I got that. She said, by the way, I could only use this as an illustration if I added the caveat that I would in fact forget all of those things if she hadn't reminded me. And here the author is kind of, as he's wrapping up this book, he's basically saying, like, there's these really important things. And make sure you don't forget this. As you think about what it means to follow Jesus, don't forget these things. We've been, and today we're wrapping up our series entitled Jesus is Greater Than This False Study on the Book of Hebrews. The writer is concluding this letter, and now he's going to see this sort of flurry of instructions and encouragements regarding living out our faith in, in our context, really specifically living out their faith in the context that they were in, but, but in doing so does the same for us. And if you remember, the, as we've worked our way through this book together, the, the majority of Hebrews has been deeply theological. The writer has been carefully looking at all of these different components of, of their faith in God prior to the arrival of Jesus, how they experienced a relationship with him, how he met them, and, and then he says how all of it, all of it, whether it was the role of the high priest or the, the practice of Sabbath, if it was the, the substitution of the sacrifice or, or um, the experience of um, the promise of the covenant, all of it has been pointing us to Jesus. Pointing us to Jesus because he is the fulfillment, he is the accomplishment of these things. And all of this is, is essential. It's, it's foundational to our faith. But all theology, when rightly understood, has implications. Good theology is and must always be deeply practical. It has to affect the way that you and I 
live our life and relate to our God or we've merely gained information. We've acquired head knowledge that we could spit out on a quiz, but it doesn't change anything about us. And that's not its point. It's meant to drive us to a deeper understanding of God. It's meant to show us what it looks like to be in a relationship with him. So the last sort of third of this book has kind of made that shift from the, the deeply theological to the practical, to understanding the implications of, of the truth that he has been talking to us, showing us about Jesus in the first two thirds of this book. So he talked to us in Hebrews chapter 10, we talked about the importance of living out our faith in community. Remember, we were reminded to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as some are, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. In Hebrews chapter 11, where we see example after example of those people who have lived out their faith, oftentimes in the face of incredibly difficult circumstances, you know, always placing their trust in God, despite the fact that they didn't know what the outcome would be, that they weren't guaranteed some sort of result. And then he says to us, but God has provided something better for us in the person of Jesus, so that you and I may also live by faith. We're reminded to run the race with endurance that God has set before us. Laying aside every weight, the sin which clings so closely, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. All of it is, is deeply practical. It's, it's the outworking, the action of a faith that has become thoroughly convinced of the argument that, Je that Jesus is ultimately the fulfillment of these promises that they've held on to. And this brings us then to Hebrews chapter 13, where now the author will conclude this letter full of these soaring theological insights on the person of Jesus Christ with simple and practical instructions. Practical instructions on how we are to live out our faith in him. Let's turn to Hebrews 13 at the beginning of the chapter. Hebrews 13. It says this, it says, Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. It says, let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear, what can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. See, part of what I love about Hebrews chapter 13 is that you're really reminded that this is a letter that this is a letter that he's writing to this group of people that he cares about, that he deeply wants them to, to get it, to understand it. And so it's personal and it's practical, it's, it's relational. And as he's doing this, he says, I just, there's these things that I want you to remember. I want to make sure we don't neglect. And he begins with the reminder, the instruction to love people. Love people. I know my, my youngest daughter and I like to watch the show um, American Pickers. Has anybody ever seen that show? Mike and Frank rummaging around in people's garbage looking for different things. And oftentimes they, you know, their job is to go find all these old antiques and, and then they try to buy them and sell them for a profit. And, and so they'll, they'll come across all this sort of stuff. And one of the things that makes them capable of this is that they're able to distinguish between what's really truly garbage and what has value. And, and from time to time, they'll come across something where the owner believes that they have this, this really um, valuable item. 
And, and what makes them able to do this job is that they're able to distinguish between what is an authentic, genuine collectible and, and what's worthless. In fact, they are able to take something that somebody believes that this is, this is genuine or this is a first edition or, or whatever makes it so valuable and they're able to validate or authenticate if it is in fact genuine or if it is a forgery. Oftentimes you'll see situations where somebody has something that they hardly know is worth anything and, and these two guys will say, wow, this is actually worth tens of thousands of dollars. Or in vice versa, sometimes somebody has something that they believe to be worth an incredible amount of money and, and Mike and Frank will point out to it and say, unfortunately, this is actually a fraud. This is, this is like a remake or a, um, a forgery. And he's saying here, the author is saying, look, our ability to love people is, it is the stamp, it is the validation that you and I are the real deal that we have been changed, transformed by the gospel. To the world around us, it validates that God's work has taken place in our lives. He's ultimately saying, and, and he's talking about what makes the Christian life entirely unique in the world and the culture around them, as it does for us today. And we do not have to look far to recognize and to acknowledge that love is not always the prevailing motivation driving relationships around us. We are constantly bombarded with stories of conflict and, and divisive rhetoric that's intent on creating enemies and then we start tweeting out about how unloving this other person is being and it's constantly coming at us and it's not new. This was just as much the case some 2,000 years ago when these people are receiving the letter for the very first time as it is to us now. Just, just without the tweeting, we've added that part. But he's saying, but not here. This isn't to define us, not in the church. We are to be a place and, and we are to be a people that are defined by love. And look how he elaborates on this in verses 1 through 3. He first starts off saying in verse 1, let brotherly love continue. In fact, he's saying, love each other. That we are to be a people defined by love for each other within the community of the church. He calls this brotherly or familial love. Paul, in his letter to the church in Rome, talks about us as co-heirs with Christ. And as a result, this makes you and I brothers and sisters whether you like it or not, we're family. Faith has made us a family, and as a family, we are called to love each other. Doesn't mean we always agree. Doesn't mean that we always see eye to eye. It doesn't mean that we never get on each other's nerves. But even in the midst of that, we are called to love each other like a real family. I am called to love the other person even in the midst of the disagreement. And he's saying this matters. Loving each other matters. It matters to the world around us that is watching us, seeing how we treat each other, talk, seeing how we talk about each other. Think of it this way. What hope will we give to a community who is watching all of us that they would walk in here and feel loved if if we aren't effectively loving each other? What, what are we communicating to them about what their experience will be if they see us at some point in time bad-mouthing each other or tearing each other down or operating in constant conflict? What hope are we giving them that their experience will be any different? So he starts there. He starts with the basics. He said we have to love each other well. Because if we fail to love each other, they're never going to believe that we'll love them. And that's what he goes on to. He talks about in, in verse 2, he says, don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers, or essentially, don't forget to show love to those outside of this community. So if the first instruction is inward, this one is outward. And we don't, we don't have time to unpack all of the implications of this today. I wish... I wish that we did, but I only want to say and emphasize here that this is who we are aspiring to be 
as a church. This is, this is what has been modeled to us for generations, but this is what we feel like God has set in front of us is to love the world around us effectively, passionately, with commitment and sacrifice. This is the significance of our name, of Chapel Street Church. That name was not selected because there is a street named Chapel that we have a church on. That name was selected because our homes are to be a place where people experience the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Where the stranger receives hospitality, where you and I become a chapel on our street. Alistair Begg, uh, a pastor that I, I enjoy listening to in Ohio, says it this way. He says, the church of Jesus Christ should be available to show love, affection, and acceptance to those who have not been able to find it anywhere else. Love, acceptance, and affection to those who have not been able to find it anywhere else. And let's be clear, this isn't easy. In fact, it can be really difficult at times, but it is our calling. It is the outworking of our faith. Again, he moves on. He talks about those in prison, the mistreated, the, the marginalized, and those in need. And the author has in mind here, he's talking specifically about the followers of Jesus within their community who have been persecuted and imprisoned as a result of their faith. But I think it's fair to apply this more generally in our context to situations both within and outside of our walls where there is immediately those who are in need, where there is those who are experiencing injustice, where we can align ourselves with the marginalized. And this is what I love so much about, about working here and being able to see week after week after week our Shepherd's Heart ministry. And I know so many of you have invested in that and they serve there, but I love this, what's happening there and what's growing there because there's opportunity to come alongside those who have immediate need. And, and Erin Wise, who leads this department, I love the way, I love her heart because so often somebody will say, thank you so much for doing this. It's amazing that Chapel Street Church would do this. You know what she says to him? Oh, we didn't do this. This is God. God did this for you. Like he's done stuff for us, he's doing stuff for you, it's just what he does. And it's this incredible opportunity to show people who God is and what he's done for them. So the question becomes, how do we do this? How do we live this out? What makes this possible? And it's what, what he's been talking about all along. It's the restorative work of Jesus. It's the fact that Jesus has enabled us to be in a relationship with our Father. It's the fact that my vertical relationship with God, because of Jesus, has been redeemed and restored, that it changes all of my horizontal relationships. So the way that, that we all relate to each other, the way I relate to you, the way I relate to my neighbors, the people outside of these walls, God has changed, Jesus has changed all of that. Because I have been the recipient of his incredible, sacrificial, um, unconditional love for me. And I am meant to be a channel of that exact same thing to the people around me. So the question that I've been wrestling with this week as I've been processing this passage is how accurate of a picture of God's love have I, have I portrayed to the people around me? How accurate do my neighbors, does my family, do my friends, do my coworkers, how accurate of a picture of God's love for them have they received as a result of what I'm communicating, what's flowing through me? And at times I'll tell you, I don't like the answer. I don't. It's convicting. But I'm reminded of what, what we see in 1 Corinthians, that if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love. I am only a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. He starts there. He says, love people. He gets specific now in the context of relationships, and he goes on and he says, honor marriage. Honor marriage. I, uh, I, every time around this time of year, I, I get a little introspective because this is the season anniversary of my dad passing away seven years ago. And, and I always try to take time to just kind of remember his legacy in my life. I, I had a great relationship with my dad. 
He's an incredible guy. He was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and, 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 um, and passed away. And I always just sort of want to preserve his memory. And so I, I, I take time at this season to just remember what he taught me kind of thing and, and try to get specific about things that I saw in him that I want to be true in my life. I, and it was just kind of as a way of, uh, of honoring his legacy. And one of the things that God just brought to my heart and my mind this year as I was remembering him was the way that he loved my mom. Like I, I had the incredible privilege of growing up in a home where, where I did not have to wonder about how my parents felt about each other. And that doesn't mean that they never fought. It doesn't mean that there was never conflict in the home. There was what, that they were incredibly committed to each other. And my dad was incredibly honoring of my mom and incredibly honoring of, of their marriage. In fact, he was also, it's like at times, I, I felt like annoyingly careful. Um, I thought then, I don't think that now. Where if somebody was sort of telling a crude joke or making like a, a degrading comment about women that they were trying to be humorous with, like my, I, my dad just wouldn't be a part of it. He just, he'd just kind of walk away and just say, I'm not, I don't think that's funny, you know. And remember this word honor here in this passage is what stands out to me because I think the legacy left is he showed me what it looks like to, to honor your wife. He says here in this passage, let marriage be held in honor among all and let, let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. And the writer of Hebrews is reminding readers once again that within this community, within the church, we are to be a people that value marriage. And by that, I think it's important that we say that, that valuing marriage is not devaluing singleness. Uh, sometimes when we start talking about marriage within the church, we can almost make it sound like if you're single, you're a second class citizen. And that's not what he's saying at all. Matter of fact, he's saying this is for all of us. Paul actually talks about singleness and the oppor kingdom opportunity that exists, the importance of that. But he's, saying, he's not saying, he's saying all of us, single, married, kids, families, whatever, whoever we are, value marriage. It's important that we understand how countercultural this was in this day because it was not uncommon in the Greco-Roman world for, for men to almost have the expectation of having a mistress in addition to their wife, infidelity was rampant and, and commonplace. So he's speaking into this culture and he's saying, but not here, not among us. Just as he exhorted us to love people regardless of their background, no matter where they came from, who they were, what their ethnicity was, we're to love everybody. That was incredibly countercultural. It was a very tribal, very specific culture in that world. And just like just like that, he's saying now, and I want you, I want this to be a place that honors marriage, that honors marriage. The word honor here carries with it the idea of placing high value on, respect, because it was designed by God, because it was given to us as a gift from God, this concrete, this visual representation of the love of God to the world around us. And we're going we're gonna to dig more into this in January. We're going to begin a study on the book of Ephesians. Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus where he's going to spend more time talking about marriage. But, but he just says something in that passage in chapter 5 where he talks about marriage and, and a really good, a really loving marriage as having this almost evangelistic effect. Where people can see that around us and it's this reflection of something greater, a greater love that says, I want to know more about that because it will stand out just as it did then, just as it does now when we reflect the love of God to those around us in our marriages. Saying marriage matters. It mattered then and it matters now. So again, the, 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 the processing for me is how, how is my marriage reflecting God's love? Do I, in word and in action, honor both my wife and, and God's gift of marriage in such a way that the world around me catches a glimpse of God's incredible love for them? Once again, this is sort of this uniqueness of, of Christian living in that culture. Again, he goes on, he says, this third really practical instruction that he gives them is, is learn to to be content. Learn to live with contentment. It's like when you ever watch kids play, 
Have you ever seen this where two kids will be playing and the one really wants the toy that the other has and so you, you try to teach them to share and you take toys and you switch and now that he has the toy that they wanted before, that's not the one they want. They just want the one that the other one has, right? Have you seen your kids do this? It's like a microcosm of all of us in many ways of, of what we are. And look what the author says here in verse five. He says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with whatever you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? I love the end of that. See, the prevailing message in our world is to have whatever we want and to want what we do not have. The result of that is this relentless pursuit of more and a never-ending sense of dissatisfaction. But once again, he says to the community receiving this letter, that's not to be us. That's not how we're to be defined because we have a relationship with Jesus. And in full disclosure here, this is not, a contentment for me has not always been an area of consistency. As a matter of fact, I think I probably just said that the nicest way possible about that. <laughs> It's, it's an area of, of struggle and challenge for me, oftentimes in life. I, I wish it weren't so, and it's an area that God's grown in me, and yet I know in my heart and life there's times when I fall back into to old routines. But I'll tell you, when I make progress, when I'm growing and learning to be content with what God has given me, it's because I am firmly planted in this simple truth that he is saying here, that I have, I have Jesus. What more could I possibly want? What more could I possibly need in my life? When, when that truth penetrates my heart and resides there, that's where I learn to be content. That's why he, he recites the words of Jesus and that promise that I will never leave you or forsake you. I have, we have, you have what we cannot lose. And then the writer says so powerfully, quoting the psalmist, what can man do to me? What can man do to me? I have Jesus. This doesn't mean that we all sell everything and, and run off and live in isolation on the side of a mountain. But it does change the way that we relate to what we have and what we don't have. It changes the way that we view that which God has given us. And I think it's important the way he says, free yourself from money. I think that word, that whole idea of being free from the love of money. That whole idea of being free there is important. When I let that go, it no longer becomes the driving motivation or the preoccupation of my life. Throughout this letter, he's made the case that Jesus is greater than. In fact, I think when you add this all up, I think it's fair to say that the author is making the case that Jesus is in fact greatest. That he is greatest. And now when we apply this to what we have and we apply it to what we do not have, what results is, is contentment. This final piece of application here, he reminds the people there to follow their leaders, to follow their leaders. One of the things that I keep on my desk at all times with me is this picture. Um, you can't see it here, but it's up on the screen. And this was a gift about 15 years ago from one of my students uh, on a mission trip in the Navajo uh, Reservation in the northeast corner of Arizona. Um, we're laying, we're starting to work on a very small house for a family that was going to live there. And we're working on some of the cornerstones. And I'm, the student's name is Julie Rue. Well, it's, she's married now. I, I don't remember what her married name is. But I'm showing her kind of how to set a, a cornerstone and how to lay mortar and, and was teaching her how to do these things. And I was far from an expert. But she gave me this picture and she wrote verse 7 from this chapter on here. She says, remember your leaders. Those who spoke the word of God, do you consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith? And it's always been this powerful reminder to me that people are watching, that she was watching in that moment and, and, and other people... Now my own three daughters are watching the way that I live my life. It inspires me as a leader to, to be reminded, to be careful of what I'm showing them in the life that I live. But I also keep it there because it reminds me what it means to be a follower. What it means to follow those who have been put in leadership over me. 
Verse 17 even gets more specific. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. And let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And it's almost a little bit, honestly, like awkward to preach these verses because it feels like it could be misconstrued as sort of this message that says, hey, people, make sure that you're in line with what we're doing here, okay? And that's not the heart of it at all, at least not for us. And I know I speak for the staff and the pastors and for Jeff and for all of us. We want, we, we desire to be the sort of leaders that will model faith in Jesus, we want to be the kind of people that are defined by love and that honor marriage and that live in contentment. We want to be like Paul when he says, follow me as I follow Christ. We want to do this well. But we also know, and I think all of you probably have a pretty good idea, that we won't do this perfectly. In fact, there will be times, and if any of you know me, have been around me very long, that I'm going to disappoint you. There will be times when I will fail you where I will need to ask you to forgive me. And even in the midst of that, when we recognize in our failures, is we want to be the sort of people there that, that provide an example of what it means to, to live a life, to follow Jesus. But I don't read these verses from the perspective of a leader. I, I read these verses from the perspective of one who is called to follow. And although I think we could apply this in a corporate sense collectively together, I more want you to think about it on a personal level, specifically around the question, who has God put in your life to help you grow closer to Christ? Who has God put in your life to help you grow closer to, God, to Christ? Because essentially what the author, the writer is saying here is don't ignore those people. Whether that's a friend or a family member, a parent or a grandparent, it could be a small group leader, it could be your D group leader, if you're a high school student, it could be a neighbor, it could be any number of people. But he's saying, who are those people in your life? And don't ignore them because I've put them there for a reason. They've gone before you, they're further down the road than you, and they're meant to show you what it looks like to follow Jesus, and they won't do it perfectly, and they're going to mess up. But even as they do, learn from that. Watch them, follow them. Don't ignore these people. And all of this, this entire thing, all of these applications that he gives us here, this reminder of what it looks like to run the race, it is all rooted in verse 8. That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The whole reason that this letter some 2,000 years ago feels so relevant to us today is because the work that Jesus was doing in them is the work that he has done in us and the work that he wants to do in the world around us. This is why the author says Jesus is greater. This is why this never changes and it never will. This is why we can say together that he is greater than me and that he is greater than all of us because he is the same yesterday and today and forever. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this opportunity to work together through this incredible letter that was written in a very different context to a very different group of people than our own and yet remains so incredibly powerful and personal to us as the church. So God, remind us once again that we are to be a people defined by love, that we are to be a people who live contently, who honor marriage, and allow us to follow those who show us what it looks like to do that. God, continue to accomplish that in our hearts and lives, and we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. When death was arrested and my life began, before I offer this morning's benediction, if we can pray with you, and I know sometimes we, we think of this as, as, as this kind of like, well, there's really some crisis in my life, and that's not it. If you're struggling to love somebody, if you're struggling to, to figure out what it means to live with contentment or uh, to honor your marriage or to follow somebody that God's placed in your life as a leader, let's, we'll pray with you. We'd love to pray with you. We're, by the way, those of us down here to pray are struggling with all the same things. So don't worry about that. 
now receive this morning's benediction. Go now in the name of Jesus Christ, who has loved us so perfectly, who has given us everything that we need in him so that we might demonstrate the same to the world around us. Send us in your name. Amen.